Hi friends, so today I'm going to continue sharing my notes from an online course offered by Tsinghua University called History of Chinese Architecture. Last time in part one, which I linked below, I summarized the first part of the overview lecture where we went through the six time periods in ancient Chinese architecture and discussed some characteristics of each period as well as Western comparisons. Last time, I left off with a question that I personally had while listening to the opening lecture of the course on Chinese architecture. There seems to be so little of ancient Chinese architecture left standing today, and what's left over typically doesn't seem as grand and monumental as all the great ruins in the West. And so, does that mean ancient Chinese architecture was inferior? The implicit assumptions in my question were immediately challenged by the professor who asked, why do we subconsciously think that long-lasting is good and monumental is good? Perhaps because when we talk about world architectural history, we're often very heavily influenced by the ideas of Vitruvius, a Roman architect who lived around 70 BC. He proposed the idea that all buildings should have three attributes, strength, utility, and beauty. But it's unfair to judge Chinese architecture with Western metrics. And to understand Chinese architecture, we have to first understand its guiding principles. And as with everything else in the world, it's super complex. I feel like what was presented in the lecture was also an incomplete picture, but it's a starting point for sure. Let's start with the Chinese analog of Vitruvius. Ancient Chinese architecture did have guiding philosophy and principles analogous to those of Vitruvius, and they actually appeared earlier than Vitruvius. Da Yu, or Yu the Great, is a legendary king who lived around 2100 BC. And speaking of Da Yu, there's actually a very interesting archaeological science paper published in Science Magazine a few years back um, that marries science and history and um, touches on a, a legend uh, regarding Da Yu's flood control. It's super interesting. I linked it below. Feel free to check it out if you're interested. But of course, that's totally off topic. Um, da Yu was quoted in Shang Shu, the first written records in Chinese history, to have said, so if we dissect this, it means the virtue of a ruler is seen in his good government and is consequently seen in the nourishing of the people. The elements of water, fire, metal, wood, earth, and grain must be regulated. The rectification of virtue, the tools and other things that supply the conveniences of life, and having abundant resources for sustentation, all three of these things must be harmoniously attended to. So analogous to Vitruvius's strength, utility, beauty, the Chinese guiding principles were zheng de, li yong, hou sheng, rectification of virtue, convenience of life, and securing abundant means of sustentation. Dissecting this even further, all three principles kind of line up. Convenience of life is kind of similar to Vitruvius's principle of utility. Securing abundant means of sustentation is the Chinese take that differs from Roman ideals of strength. So what even does securing abundant means of sustentation mean and why didn't the Chinese value durability? The professor explained it in a poetic way, that ancient Romans valued strength beyond the timescale of a few generations because their architecture was built for the gods on the other side, while in China, buildings were built for the sustentation of humans on this side, in this life. So now we've explained two of the three principles. Now, what does rectification of virtue mean, and how does that relate to Vitruvius' ideal of beauty? Vitruvius' idea of beauty I understand as outer beauty, right, and is reflected in the extravagant and monumental nature of a lot of ancient architecture in the West, while rectification of virtue I kind of understand as inner beauty. At this point in the lecture, I was a little confused. Virtue, morality, these are such abstract ideas. What does it even mean for architecture to embody and reflect the virtue and morality of the ruler? Well, for an idea, we can look to Confucius. Confucius is quoted in Lun Yu to have said, Yu wu jian ran yi, fei yin shi er zhi xiao hu gui shen, le yi fu er zhi mei hu fu mian, bei gong shi er jing li hu gou xu, yu wu jian ran yi. So breaking this down, yu wu jian ran yi, which Confucius repeats twice, means I find no flaw in Yu the Great. But why does he find no flaw in Yu? Because of the following three theories which Yu embodies. The first, 
fei yin shi er zhi xiao hu gui shen, is that he was frugal when it comes to his own food and drink, but displayed the utmost filial piety toward its ancestors and spirits. The second, le yi fu er zhi mei hu fu mian, is related to clothing. Clothing can be simple, but we must pay attention to the styles and symbols on the clothing and ensure that they correspond with the position of the person for whom the clothing is designed within the hierarchy of society. The third and most relevant to our discussion is Bei Gong Shi Er Jing Li Hu Gong Xu. This is a theory that the ruler can live in humbler palaces and should instead focus more wealth and resources on irrigation and agriculture, which are more closely tied to the prosperity of the people. So. This is essentially the theory of morality, right? All three of these theories are essentially guiding principles or expectations that are placed on the rulers, and it is under this context, this connection established between architecture and the morals and ethics of the individual, that the ancient Chinese standard for judging architecture was formed. Within this framework. How magnificent or monumental a building is is not important, or not even necessarily a good thing. And the professor goes on to provide a very concrete and illustrative example of this idea. In Shenzi Wai Pian, there is a story where an envoy from the state of Di or Jai. I'm actually not too sure how to pronounce the character, but I'll just stick to Di. So, an envoy from the state of Di was sent to the state of Chu. The king of Chu started showing off his magnificent palace and asked the envoy, "Does the state of Di have monumental platforms like these?" And the envoy from Di said, "Our king lives in a very simple, unornamented cottage, and yet he still thinks that it's too much for the workers and that the occupants' lives are way too comfortable." And this put the king of Chu to shame. And so here I had another question, right? Morality and virtue, as reflected in humble buildings, among other things, is obviously an ideal. But is that actually reflected in architecture? Were rulers actually not extravagant? When we look at certain halls, for example, in the Forbidden City, can we really call them humble? Again, as if reading my mind, the professor goes on to explain that these principles are only a part of the picture, and goes on to introduce more layers of complexity. But before we do that, it's still important to recognize that even though these principles aren't always followed religiously, these Confucian ideals that tie together architecture and other things with the morals and ethics of the individual can be thought of as an upper bound on extravagance, in the sense that whenever a ruler starts building something extravagant, they will be criticized by contemporary Confucians. Scholars, the first layer of complexity is moderation and balance, which is something that also pervades Chinese thought. The most obvious thing that might come to mind is the theory of yin and yang. Yin and yang can be seen as opposing poles, and an excess of either yin or yang is bad for life and health. As the philosopher Lao Tzu said, the two have to be blended to achieve balance and harmony. Similar ideas can be extended to architecture. There are some more literal examples, such as the columns representing yin rising from the ground and the roof representing yang, with the sunshine trickling down from above. And that's why you sometimes see cloud patterns、uh, in interior decorations above.、Uh, another literal example is how some buildings are round on top, representing heaven, and squarish on the bottom, representing the ground. But I want to spend more time on the second layer of complexity, which is kind of related to the ideas of yin and yang, but a little bit more abstract. We can see the second layer of complexity through the theories of shi xing or appropriate size theory and da zhuang or magnificence theory. Shi xing literally translates to appropriate size, and the theory says that buildings、um, have to be appropriately sized to achieve harmony. So, for example, in a book from 200 BC ish called Lu Shi Chunqiu, there's a passage that says a huge building would be filled with yin, and a palace on a high platform will be filled with yang. An excess of either is bad, and that's why ancient kings would not live in huge buildings or high palaces. This idea of moderation is very widespread in ancient Chinese architecture. And another fun example is during the Warring States period, where the guy called Lu Ai Gong wanted to build a huge palace. But then a minister said, "What's the point? If you have a huge palace and you share with a lot of people, it'll be too noisy. But if you stay with very few people, you'll be lonely." And Lu Ai Gong thought, "Oh, this is very reasonable," and he stopped the construction. So in Chinese architecture, we probably not. Find any giant gloomy castles, but rather moderately sized buildings with good penetration of light and circulation of air. But you see, Chinese thought values the unity of opposites, kind of like yin and yang, which complement each other. And so we have an opposing complementary theory, da zhuang or magnificence theory.
Da Zhuang theory originates from Zhou Yixi Zixia, and one of its many implications is that important buildings representing the emperor should have a striking effect. You know, one that makes people feel a deep respect, awe, and some fear. An interesting example illustrating this theory is a conversation between Emperor Gaozu of Han Dynasty and Prime Minister Xiao He during the construction of Weiyang Gong during the Western Han Dynasty. So Prime Minister Xiao He was building this palace, and it was extremely extravagant. And when the emperor saw it, he wasn't too happy. He asked, "The world is still at war, and we don't even know if we're going to win. So why are you building such a magnificent palace?" To which Xiao He responded. Building a palace in this time of uncertainty is to prepare for the certainty of the future. The future emperor will possess the whole world, so the palace needs to be magnificent to reflect his imperial majesty. And the emperor was happy with that answer. We can see here the design of Weiyang Palace, which was restored based on archaeological excavations of the ruins, and can see that it was quite big and grand. So, in summary, there is not one answer to what were the guiding principles of ancient Chinese architecture. There are many ideas at play here, many of which are opposing ideas.、Uh, this lecture touched on some ideas, but there are definitely so many more.、Uh, ideas mentioned in this lecture include that of Zheng De Li Yong Hou Sheng and the Confucian Bei Gong Shi Er Jing Li Hu Go Shi, from which we get that palaces should be humble and embody the morality of the ruler. There are ideas relating to Yin and Yang that lead to certain concrete. Architectural motifs like cloud details.、Uh, there's a theory of shixing, which prefers moderately sized rooms that have good sun penetration and air circulation. And then there's the theory of da zhuang, which, in opposition, calls for magnificence in palaces. We can actually see these seemingly opposing ideas at play in the design of the Forbidden City. The Forbidden City is small compared to the Weiyang Palace that I gave as an example for the da zhuang theory, but it's still quite magnificent. But interesting to note、uh, is that the monumental parts of the Forbidden City, which give it its imposing dignity, are the parts used for the outer court, or the parts of the court that are associated with rituals, like the ceremony of the ascension to the throne. The outer court occupies two thirds of the space, and the actual living spaces, the inner court, only occupy one third. And even within the inner court, the more fancier palaces are again. Uh, mostly for big occasions like weddings, and are thus rarely used. And the spaces that the emperor actually uses daily, such as Yangqing Dian, looks pretty similar to a normal person's courtyard. So, in the design of the Forbidden City, we see the opposition of shixing and da zhuang at play. The emperor follows the ideas of shixing for daily living spaces, and follows the idea of da zhuang for things that face the outside or need to express、uh, imperial majesty. So this concludes the first lecture of the course. Starting from the second lecture, I think we will start doing deep dives into、uh, each time period chronologically, and so it should be really fun.、Um, thanks for watching, and see you next time.